Hello everyone, welcome back to Tabletop and Hobby Stop. We are on to game one of Majestic 13, the newest release by Snarling Badger Games. Um, you can see I already have my table set up. Uh, I actually did a video where I built the team, I set up the table, I uh, rolled for the monster diplomacy and all of that. I'm gonna go ahead and put my stats over here on this side of the screen and I'll uh, also put what what the uh, what the alien creature is, which is going to be a Benzith Nightbringer for all of you guys who have the rule book that starts on page 138. He's the last guy before the rules summary. Um, there was one thing I messed up when I was making my team that one of the uh, one of my commenters on the last video did uh, point out to me for when you're making your captain or your, uh, the commander, excuse me, you actually get to roll twice, uh, so 2d6 twice for each stat, and you take the highest. Well, that worked out extremely well for me. I actually rolled, let's see here, so for the first one I rolled a 5 and a, and this is out of d6, so a 5 and a 6, and then I actually rolled uh, snake eyes for the second one. And then I have a dexterity of 11 and a fortitude of 16. I'm gonna set all of that over there on the side of the screen so you can see. But if you guys watch that first video and then you see my stats on the commander for the second video and you say, that's not what he rolled, well, that's, that's why. So we're gonna go right ahead and get into the deployment right away. Uh, so we have our Night Stalker over here and I have Anything on this side of the board I, is where I can deploy my guys. I have zero reason why I'm not going to just kind of front load this, but I don't want to be stupid. I don't want my guys completely out in the open, uh, even though there isn't much going on. Now, since this is a stalker, I have a feeling uh, that he's going to be utilizing the terrain a whole lot more than some other creatures might. I'm going to place my commander right up over here, Shoshana right there behind him, just so we can have a medic on, on both sides of the field. Uh, but I will also start making a roundabout play over here with my people. I think, I think cutting a wide berth and almost encircling him in, and, and for my secondary objective, basically I have to collect samples of his DNA. So I want to go into one of the pieces of terrain that he's touched. So I think that's going to be this guy's duty. Uh, he's going to run up, he's gonna play a little bit bait and a little bit objective grabber here. So turn one monster phase, he is in here. We are going to start since his acuity is 25. He does get a start us off. A stalker first activates according to his acuity, a stalker activates again at its acuity minus 10. So it's gonna activate at 25 and then at 15. So we'll activate again if it is hidden and an enemy successfully reveals the stalker from hidden. Uh, once the team member that successfully spotted the stalker has completed their turn, the stalker will make a bonus activation. A stalker may never activate more than three times during a turn. So I really like this. It's almost like once you, once you catch the animal, you know, these, these ambush predators, once they feel like they've been seen, they're going to lash out. He is going to start with his move. Uh, it doesn't matter if he goes around or over. Uh, we're just going to say he definitely gets uh, into contact with Victor, uh, in which case he is going to attack. So the Benzeth Nightbringer makes two attacks with its Dark Claws, melee combat, 2d6 damage. If this attack hits, the target must succeed on a dexterity stat check, 19, 23, or be blinded. Uh, the 19 and then 23 in the brackets is whether it's phase one or phase two, I believe. So let's see here. I'll go with the black d20 here. That is going to be a five plus its combat of 21, which gets us to 26 which is not enough to hit, and that is going to be the, the Nightbringer's turn. Uh, his first turn comes out, tries to attack, uh, and does not land a hit. Now we have, uh, let's see here, John McLeod, my, my fearless leader. He is 
going to move to start. He's going to fire from there. He's got a pretty good vantage point. Let's, uh, let's see how he does. Roll. We get a four. I don't think that's going to do it. Four plus two would be six, plus our combat of 17. Actually, I think that does do it, because the, uh, the Nightbringer only has a defense of 20. That is actually going to be a hit. Our assault rifle is uh, 2d6. So we're going to roll that up, and that is going to be six damage onto the Nightbringer. All right, guys, so that is the uh, first attack successful. Now, here is going to be the vital second attack. So with my guy Hal Bishop, I actually have tracking beacons. It'll prevent the Nightbringer from being able to go hidden again. So I'm going to grab my guy right about there. And we are going to roll for that combat. Ooh, that is a one. That is a critical failure. So uh, I do not shoot him with my uh, tracking beacon. That is unfortunate. And that is Hal's turn. We now get to choose whether it's going to be Shoshana or the Nightbringer. I think Shoshana is probably the smart play here. So I'm going to take her. And she has a dexterity of 10 going out here. So we're going to shoot at the Nightbringer from right here. That is a 2 plus her combat. That's only 15, 6, 17. That does not hit. Uh, so the Nightbringer is still going just fine and it is now his turn. Nightbringer, if the Benzeth Nightbringer was spotted when hidden since its last activation, or if it begins its turn with at least two enemies within 12 inches, which there are more than two enemies within 12 inches, and it did not utilize Nightbringer during its last activation, it will now utilize Nightbringer. All enemies within 12 inches must succeed on a dexterity stat check, 19, or suffer 1d6 damage and be blinded. This attack has the psionic keyword. The Benzeth Nightbringer becomes, then becomes hidden. Everyone within 12 inches is going to suffer uh, the attack. So let's go ahead and start with Victor. That's going to be 1d6 against Victor. So five, then 1d6 against Shoshana. That's going to be one and 1d6 against John. That'll be two. That is within 12. So the only person spared right now is actually going to be Angus. So let's go ahead and roll for uh, Hal got two damage, Hal received two damage as well. Excuse me guys, <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of stuff to work out. Um, so I, I was supposed to roll that dexterity stat check. Instead, I just rolled damage. So all enemies within 12 must succeed on a dexterity stat check or suffer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go around and I'm going to roll their dexterity checks. If it hit, they will take the damage they would have. If not, they will not take that damage. And we'll start in that same order with Victor. So he, got, he rolled six. Plus, he takes the damage because that's only 17. We're going to go to Shoshana. Shoshana is 10 plus 10 plus 10. That's 20. That makes it. So she is safe. She actually does not take that one point of damage. Uh, we will go now over to John. John rolls a 2. Something tells me that's going to be it. Dexterity 11. John does take his damage. And then we will go over to Hal. Hal does critically fail, so he definitely takes his damage. All right, if ever you make a mistake on games, I it's just kinda do your best to move forward. Remedy as best you can, but don't, don't get caught up on it. Uh, I'm not gonna restart my turn or anything like that. Uh, just a small thing, uh, most of the people still took the damage um, and they are blinded, which that means that they cannot check for hidden if there is Nobody, uh, nobody else in their acuity range, basically. So bad news bears, we're gonna have to try to clear some statuses. 
on the next turn. But this Nightbringer is now hidden and he gets to run away as far as he can into a hidden area. So let's let's go ahead and see. He has, excuse those sirens guys. Okay, so the Benzith Nightbringer has a move of 23 inches. So he can get pretty, mer pretty much anywhere he wants to be on the board. Thematically, I think uh, to be away from people, he would probably hide back over here. We have half of our team hidden, or uh, <laughs> sorry, blinded. So with Angus, I'm going to go ahead and take him up over here. And he will try and uh, check for the, he will try and check for the uh, Nightbringer. All right guys, so what I'm kind of sitting at right, right now is that I actually, I do have, uh, I don't know if you can see that red line. I do technically have line of sight physically. However, what hidden does is it does not allow you to draw line of sight. So they're essentially, you can't attack them. However, as part of my attack, I can make a check against his uh, basically camouflage value to try and spot him out in the open so that I can attack him. And the acuity check is actually going to be 22, so it's not it's not terrible. Uh, let's see if we can get a dice tray up there. Uh, it's not terrible. We're gonna go ahead and try to make that. I got a 19, so that is definitely spotted. Um, so we spotted him. We now get to roll uh, for the attack which is 12 plus two, so 14 plus nine. So 14 plus nine, that is 23. That hits. Now let's roll for damage. We got five damage on it. See here, we are at 94 health on this guy. First turn, doesn't feel like we're doing so hot yet. Now we get to see if Victor gets to attack. Uh, Victor is uh, really good at combat, however, he's not the best for acuity, so he's, he's always going to go last, but he is going to be powerful, which is why I like the idea of the uh, Night Soccer coming out of action. However, uh, as I just forgot, he actually gets to go because we just revealed him from being hidden. So, so we have, if a Stalker starts its activation outside of one inch of all enemies and is not hidden, it will move to cover against the nearest enemy if possible. Uh, if it has an active action on its profile to become hidden, it will then use that action and become hidden. If it does not have this action available, it will move out of line of sight uh, to as many enemies as possible. So he's going to run right up here into cover with this. And he is going to try to become hidden if he is able to. Okay, so it doesn't have anything to become hidden. So basically, it's just going to try to hide from as many people's line of sight as possible. Uh, which I think that where I have him now is a pretty good happy medium. Okay, so what I have to do to clear Victor's uh, condition is going to be a dexterity roll of 20 plus. So let's go ahead and try to clear that off. That is a nine. Where is Victor? Nine plus 11, which meets it. And in this game, it is meet or beat. So that does indeed just barely clear off the uh, condition. And what he is going to do is he is going to use that wonderful dexterity to run around and he is going to open up into the Night Stalker. That is an 11 plus 14 plus two definitely makes the 20 that we need, two D6. That'll be six points of damage. Guys, you know what I forgot to do? I actually forgot to do the foobar roll for this one. So I'm gonna roll twice for my foobar roll here on turn two. We're gonna start with uh, the plus one, so that is going to be one plus one, does not equal the six. Now we're gonna roll again. This will be plus two, so seven. That is a foobar roll. According to my special 
Uh, special thing, I get to roll on the table twice and pick which one I want. So let's grab our d20. I'll grab two d20s. Oh, guys. <laughs> they are both 14. So I rolled... What are the odds of that? I rolled, uh, probably not going to be able to see it. I just rolled two 14s. Uh, so it doesn't look like I have a choice. The, the universe wants me to choose uh, Sudden Storm. So, Sudden Storm. All models have a maximum line of sight of 12 and cannot see other models more than 12 inches away. So that is going to be a painful uh, thing to try to get past here. So let's go ahead and start our next turn off. Once again, we are going to start with the stalker and he is not hidden and he is outside of one inch. So let's see here. So activation outside of one inch and is not hidden move to cover against the nearest enemy if possible. If it has no other action on its profile to become hidden, it will then use an action and become hidden. Uh, if it does not have this action available, it will move out of line of sight to as many enemies as possible, ending in cover if possible. I think I misread that last time. So, it is going to hang out right there, and then it is going to use an action to become hidden. So it is now hidden again. Uh, we cannot spot it. However, that is okay. What I am going to do is just to be safe, I would like to take John and I'm going to run him up and I'm going to set him just inside to collect my uh, sample. So the, the Nightbringer, hard to see. John's on the other side of this here. And he is in line of sight to the Nightbringer. However, he is also inside of the um, inside of the structure. So now we are going to try to spot the Nightbringer and see if we can rain down a little bit more fire. So we'll go white to spot, and black will be the attack just to speed things along. So ten plus. My acuity, that definitely spots him. So he's spotted. He's going to activate again. And I think he's going to end up hiding again based on his, his uh, mode. So he's really scurrying away. This guy is not causing a lot of damage just because we keep on spotting him. Now 14 plus my combat of 17 definitely hits. 2d6. And that is going to be three damage, not what I would like to see. So according to how I'm reading this, guys, he's basically just going to stay there and, and stay stagnant. However, I don't like that idea. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to get him to run around a little bit. And I'm going to get him to go over here because that feels uh, more practical that feels more like what he would do is try to isolate a single character. Unfortunately, it's going to be Angus in this instance because we have more guys on this side of the table. Uh, judgment call, maybe I'm doing that wrong. However, I just feel like it may make for more compelling gameplay. And as far as it goes, the stalker, he, that's, that's something that I feel he would do. So he'll go over here. He definitely has the movement. He is going to take an action to become hidden once again. And that is his second action of the round. And he has not really made any attacks because we keep on spotting him and he doesn't like to be seen. So maybe that's how this guy's supposed to work out. Uh, and if it's not, I, I hope uh, Vince or Adam are, is watching this and they can throw it down below. Just let me know if I'm messing up, if you guys know anyways. Hal is going to turn, of course, get within 12 inches, which he is already in. So he's going to turn around. He's also touching um, a piece of terrain that the creature touched, as is. 
Angus over here. So our, our uh, mission is well accomplished, but I like that I got on the inside of that building for thematic purposes. And we are going to make our spot check and a roll. So white is going to be the spot again. Five plus our acuity of 16. That is going to be 21, so just barely makes it. All right, guys, so here's the deal. I forgot about the blinded condition. Um, so what I did is I actually took uh, John, I moved him out a little bit so he had enough movement to go in the building and back out and get, uh, get Victor into his line of sight, which allows him to make that acuity check because of the blinded condition. I think to keep us honest, I'm gonna go ahead I'm going to pull out a couple of uh, couple of little green tokens. I'm going to throw one at Shoshana's feet. I'm going to throw one at John's feet. And then I'm going to throw another one at Hal's feet. Let's try to remove that blinded condition. So that is going to be a 15 plus 11. So he is no longer blinded. Try to spot this guy and shoot at him. Uh, so no tracking beacons on the monster. We are now gonna go with Shoshana, who is right here. We are going to roll for her uh, blinded condition. That is a 19, that's definitely taking it off. And then we need to get within 12 inches. With the dexterity of 10, let's see if we can make that happen. So 10 inches, she can get right there. And then she is out of range of the 12 inches that we need. I think what Shoshana is going to do is she's going to move up another 10 inches just to try to keep herself in that fight. So she's going to move right up to the side of this rock here. Maybe I'll have him come over here by the truck. Just keep him moving. Keep... And he'll run right over here. So that's where I'm moving. And then he is going to become hidden once again. Angus is not blinded. He is actually standing right here in the open. So he is definitely within 12 inches. Uh, oh yeah, so he's gonna turn around. I'm gonna hide him behind the bush here and he is going to make an attack. White to spot and then black to attack. We got a critical on the, on the spot and then we have a seven on the attack mixed with Angus's, oh, combat of nine, I almost said 13. That is not enough. So we are not causing the proper amount of damage uh, to this guy. And see if we can get Victor all the way over here, shall we? Victor does not need to try to spot the monster. He just needs to try to try to attack with his um, combat of 14. And that is a six plus the two for the, uh, for the scope or the target assist. That is definitely a hit. And that is going to be seven damage. There is no foobar roll for turn three since we already have our foobar event going on. We will just move straight on I think we are supposed to do Nightbringer again. So this uh, this storm, this Fubar roll actually is going to be to my detriment because it's going to attack everything within 12 inches and line of sight once again, which is basically all of these guys. So we're gonna make those dexterity checks. We'll go Shoshana first. She passes, that's a roll of an 18. Then we'll go with uh, Hal here. He has a four, so he fails. He is once again blinded. And then one D6 damage, which is going to be four more damage. Then we'll go out here to Victor. Victor will pass and then we will go over to Angus. Suppose my dice tray could be in the scale in the scene there. Uh, Angus will fail with a four, and then he will take two damage. So Angus takes two damage, 
And he is now hidden again. Again, we'll go ahead and roll to try to get rid of our blinded condition. That is an eight plus a dexterity of 11, which brings it to 19, which is not going to be enough. So he is still blinded. Uh, however, we're still going to run him up because there is someone within line of sight. So we can still attack. So 11. This is once again white die for the acuity check and then uh, to try to spot him and then the attack die. So eight plus the 18. He is spotted once again. Attack of five plus my combat 17. That definitely hits. Uh, plus I have uh, plus one acuity to spot hidden because I have my scanner. And that will be four damage on the beast. I don't know if I'm causing damage fast enough here. That spots him, which means that Nightbringer goes again right away, which is going to be, I believe, Final Vision. Nightbringer makes a single attack against the blinded enemy using Final Vision, Melee Psionic, 4d6 plus 2. If this attack hits, the target must succeed on a Fortitude stat check, 19, or be stunned. As long as they are stunned, they cannot remove the blinded condition. In addition, whenever this enemy rolls to clear a condition, they must roll twice and select the lowest result. Unfortunately, we're going to make it against Hal here. So, because it does say melee, so he'll get out there. So that's supposed to be combat plus this. Let's go ahead and roll that. For combat check, that was a five. He did not actually hit him. So everything is all good. Hal is spared for the moment. After John, we have Hal himself, so let's try to clear that, that blinded condition. Seven, that does not clear it. However, he does have people around him. He is going to try to use that tracking beacon once again, the white to spot, the black to hit. So that is nine, plus my acuity of 16 hits, and that is an 8 plus my combat of 15 also hits with a 23, so he is no longer able to become hidden. That is going to be awesome. Shoshana is going to go since she is right there. She is not blinded. This guy is still hidden, so we're going to spot and shoot him. That is a natural 20 to spot, not that it matters, and then a 17 to shoot him. Ooh, there we go. That is nine damage. That's more what we're looking for. Go Shoshana. That, <laughs> that is awesome. I wish those would have been flipped so that 20 would have been a, our critical hit. All right, so he's touching Hal. He's within distance. Um, he is going to go ahead and make the attack on Hal. Hal is blinded right now, so that is not ideal. Rolling for the Night Stalker's damage. He gets an eight. 8 plus his combat of 21 is going to be 29, which is one short of hitting me. And then he is going to run as far away as he can. Back around the cabin here and hide from our, our guys because that's where he can get when he starts running away. Angus burns. Angus, do you remove your blinded condition? Absolutely he does. So Angus is no longer blinded. Uh, he, but unfortunately, he is pretty far away from everything. I think what he may do is run up to Hal. So we're actually going to uh, go ahead and try to heal Hal. 1d6 plus 4 to heal Hal. 5, so that heals Hal of 9 damage, which is everything he has right now. So Hal is completely healed. Uh, that is now going to be uh, Victor's turn. Victor is going to turn around, go ahead and open up on the Stalker. I do not need to try to spot him now since we have those tracking beacons on him. He is not going anywhere. So we have eight. That's 24 plus the, so that is seven damage. We are on to turn four. There's no foobar roll once again, because that already happened in turn two. Uh, we are going to have to start causing damage to this guy. 
This guy starts out, he is going to do the Nightbringer. We're going to do Dexterity for Victor. And that is a critical failure. So Victor is going to be blinded and then he is going to take three damage. He is going to then become invisible. However, because we are tracking him, he cannot become invisible. Uh, from there, we're going to grab John. He is going to roll to try to be no longer blinded. That is going to be a 16. That will absolutely do it. And he will run. He's going to get right there. John doesn't need to try to spot him. All he needs to do is just go for the damage. That will hit with a roll to 13 plus the 2, 15 plus my combat is 17. Definitely hits. Uh, 7 damage to the monster. Brings us down to 51. Hal is all the way over here. He needs to try to make tracks over to this guy. And definitely uh, can see the Nightbringer. He will roll to attack. That will be a 17, which will definitely hit seven more damage. So he is really hurting now, which is exactly where we need him to be. Shoshana, I believe. If we can make it, Shoshana has a move of 10. Once again, excuse the arm. So that gets her there, and she is within 12 inches, and also line of sight. Make her attack, which will hopefully do as well as they have been going, which a 15, and then she rolled a five and a one for damage, which will bring us down to 38. Nightbringer's turn. Now the Nightbringer, is going to make a pretty brutal attack, final vision on uh, onto Victor here. So he's gonna jump forward and make that psionic attack towards Victor. With a combat rating of 21, he needs at least a nine. Oh my goodness, he just critical. Uh, uh, that is not ideal. So let's see how this plays out. To be honest, guys, I think this might be a, a one-shot deal for Victor here. I'm Nightbringer here. That is going to be 4d6 plus 2, which will be, a, let's see here, 10, 17, 18, 19 damage on Victor of 19. So let's roll Victor's Fortitude. We're going to take this one step at a time. Fortitude is 15. Where is my die? He critically fails, so he is now stunned. Uh, what is dangerous is if the Benzith Nightbringer successfully critically hits an enemy that is blinded, the attack will deal an extra 6d6. That is going to be 16. 28 damage. That is almost a one shot in and of itself. Uh, he is well past his 30 health, so he had 8 damage on him before, plus the 19, plus the 28. So he is definitely uh, knocked out of this fight. So Victor just got completely annihilated, uh, basically in one, one fell swoop. He, he is just completely trashed on there. So uh, let's remove that real quick and we will keep on going with this turn. Uh, Victor is out, however, Angus is still in the fight and we will see if Angus can get where he needs to be. With an 11 dexterity, he should be able to get out there. Absolutely. So Angus is whoop, right there and he is going to make an attack here. All right, so Angus, that is a nine plus two uh, for 11 plus Angus's combat of 19. So that is 20, which just hits. So we do cause an additional nine damage, which is 
perfect because I think that gets us to his extremist phase potentially at 29. Okay, turn five for this guy. Since he's activating in extremis, he gets one extra action, but he does take 2d6 damage to start. So what happens in this game is once you get uh, a monster below its extremis value, which this one is 30, so I'm at 29, when he activates, there's going to be special stuff that happens to kind of speed along that end game phase. So he's, he's going to get an extra action. He is just outside of an inch of my commander over here. He's going to shoot right into Angus. He's going to take 2d6 damage for activating right off the top. So that is going to be 8 damage. So that is good news for us because 8 damage is a significant amount of his remaining damage, leaving him at 21. However, he will get to take two actions here. So his first action is going to be the basic attack. He'll need to beat a 30. So that definitely beats a 30 uh, and causes Angus nine damage. And then he will need to make a dexterity saving throw. Uh, 19, so he just makes it. And then for the second attack, he will do Nightbringer. We're gonna go ahead and start with Angus. He'll need to make another dexterity check. 15, he passes. We're going to move on to Shoshana. Shoshana, 19, she passes. We will move on to Hal. 14, he passes with a 25. And last, Commander John, for that is not a pass. So let's go ahead and roll four damage for John. Okay, so he is blinded. However, he will now need to make a blinded roll because it is his turn, so I won't set it out there yet. So eight, dexterity of eight plus the 11 brings him to 19. So that will not do it. However, we do still have everyone hanging around, so we will still be able to attack not a big deal today. Uh, that's actually something I really like. I don't know if I'm playing this wrong. Um, if I am, maybe. But right now, I really like that your character is not completely handicapped when something uh, like a condition is there. I don't feel like I'm getting my... I don't like when games take away uh, my limited actions, especially when you have such a small figure count as this game. Um, so I'm really happy about that. Now I'm going to... Uh, turn and make my attack onto this Night Stalker, or Night Bringer, excuse me. That is going to be an 8 plus 17 will hit, causing 5. However, this is actually my last move I get to make with John. Next, after John, is going to be Hal. Hal is going to turn, of course, and just start laying into, uh, and turn thematically, that's not actually an action. Uh, so thematically speaking, he's going to turn and just start unloading on the Nightbringer. He gets a five plus his combat of 15 plus the two that does hit, causing six damage, bringing him down to 10. Uh, I think Shoshana would be silly not to activate right away and try to take this guy out. 18, which is not going to be a hit. Okay, so Shoshana did not manage to do what we wanted her to do, and now the um, Night Stalker, I was hoping when he activated, he was going to hurt himself. So we literally have one chance left or with Angus, our weakest team member. None of our guys are currently blinded right now. So uh, this guy is not going to be able to do his final vision he has an extra attack, so what I'm going to say is that he is going to root around and he is going to actually attack Angus once. Four, that is not going to hit. So it says he will try to run away. Because he tries to run away to the, uh, to the object or the one that someone is actually hiding behind this Comes off a little bit cheese, but as per the rules, he is going to run behind this little 
barrier that he was originally at, and he's going to try to get as far as he can over there um, because he can't do anything with the other actions. Um, so I'm just going to have him run and then try to hide uh, because that's what he's supposed to do is, is attack, run, and, and then uh, if he's out of vision, he would try to hide. Gets out of there. Oh, I forgot to roll for his, uh, for his extremist damage, which is going to be seven damage, which brings him down to three. So as long as Angus can hit, basically, we're going to get this, but it's going to be tight. It's going to be a very, very tight game. So let's get Angus as close as he can up there. Let's try to wrap this up with a victory. We need to, we need to get, let's see here, at least a 20. We need to roll at least a nine with our targeting scope of two. We rolled, guys, we actually rolled a 10, one more than what we needed. Angus just barely pulls it out. This is our first victory. Sorry, excuse the camera work. That's just an exciting way to end. Um, he pulls out just barely making the shot uh, and pulls out a victory against the Night Stalker. Whew. Actually, I think... Okay, guys, that was a super exciting way to end the game with uh, just making it by, by one. Uh, Angus Burns, the last guy in the last turn of the last... Uh, of the last round, just barely making it to kill the Night Stalker. Set up the camera to do some naughty rolls, and then uh, we will talk about my my feelings on my uh, on my first game of Majestic 13. For the post game process, I'm just going to go right down the rule book. First, I'm going to make the injury and death table roll. Hey, I suppose it'd help if I rolled the uh, right dice here. So it's actually 3d6. I rolled a d20, I probably edited it out, but we'll go ahead and see here. 8, 9, 10, 11. So we have all clear. Oh, no ill effects. The team member has no permanent injuries and is free to return free to return to active duty. So we got really lucky here. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just throw that up real quick on the, on the thing. There is death. Permanent injury, questionable wounds, all clear, trauma, symbiote, and infiltrator. So it looks like there's a decent amount of bad stuff that can happen. I, I'm, I'm okay with the all clear roll. He's all set to return to active duty. Uh, so awesome for that. And we will continue on right down the line. So everyone receives one experience for participating. All team members that were not put out of action uh, gain an additional experience. So everyone but Victor will get an additional experience. All team members receive one additional experience if your team completed the secondary objective. So there's another for everyone. So we missed out on a couple of uh, things of experience there, but no big deal. It's our first mission. Um, plus we got extra experience for that tissue collection. Okay, so... What I did with my experience, you can spend three to increase a stat, and I just went down the line and I increased everyone's combat by one. We also get our first team rating because not everyone was put out of action, uh, so your team rating will increase, uh, and the, your team rating will lead to specialty missions down the line, and that's actually kind of the campaign. So you randomly generate missions until you get to those specialty missions, and then those specialty missions are like the campaign mode and requisitions which step which is step three and i have my specialty thing on step three i get to um add i believe it's plus one for a single requisition so basically you requisition uh two pieces of equipment and a base upgrade and then you roll bureaucracy to see if you actually receive them i have chosen to try to go with two site hubs and a weapons depot for my base upgrades. And that is a six. So we actually just got a weapons depot on our first go around. That is actually super exciting because that gives us a plus one. Now for our sighting hub, this is gonna be plus two, but we need a six plus. Uh, all right, we got a sighting hub. Now this next one's only a plus one because I just used my plus two. That is not going to get it. So we get one site hub and we did re 
try to requisition one site hub. So next time we will get a plus one to that roll. Now let's go over the uh, positives and negatives that I felt about the game. So right away the positives, I did feel like I was hunting a big elusive alien creature. I did feel like uh, I had the tactics and the strike team and we were moving together really well. Uh, and it was exciting to come so close uh, on that first mission. Um, I was a little bit underwhelmed by my, by my weapons. However, I think as we upgrade moving forward, obviously it's going to get better and better, especially after we become, uh, um, after we become like a veteran, more ve uh, veteran team and have better, uh, better weapons and ammo. Uh, there is a lot to keep track of uh, as far as the rules go, and I'm much more of a physical copy guy, so it's hard to go back and forth on these things trying to find the rules for me personally I know that I've messed I know I messed stuff up this game uh, as always go ahead and throw it down in the comments um, but I did like the feel of it what I will say is a, a big pullback for me is going to be the the monster mechanics are a little bit clunky now it's a pullback for now but I think moving into the future, when I get used to them, when I when I start working with the with the system more, it's going to become smoother. Uh, there's definitely times where I had him running around, and then later on, you guys probably noticed around turn three, I believe, I noticed that I was missing a couple of things in the monster profile because the monster uh, profile is different than the than the type profile so you have the type that'll tell you generally what the creature does and then you have the actual profile that has the special rules uh, once you get a hang of what a stalker does i think you're going to have the general idea and you can refer more to the monster than to the type however for me on my first go through that was a little bit cumbersome to go back and forth uh, i think that my team felt really good I can see the hint of where it can be a hard and unforgiving game, which I'm okay with because you're chasing uh, an alien creature through the wilderness, through the city. I'm, I'm excited. I hope I roll up a city encounter next time, maybe just to show it off. Maybe I'll, I'll fudge the roll a bit and do a city encounter anyways. Um, but I'm looking forward to the special missions. I'm looking forward to the city missions. I'm looking forward to seeing how my team can actually grow together and when we start to get better requisitions. All in all, I think that this game is definitely a win like their last one, uh, Space Station Zero. I'm excited to go through the mission profiles uh, or the um, campaign mission, which is going to be predicated on my team rating. So the better your team does, the quicker you get to move through, through those missions. And then I'm also actually excited to see how the other monsters work because uh, a stalker, I, I immediately thought big cat vibes, and it definitely felt like we were chasing a big cat through the woods with him jumping around, he jumped out. The blinded mechanic was cool, and I felt good about them not taking, uh, not taking my turn away. That does drive me nuts when, when you don't get a turn, when you're handicapped, when you have only five models and you start handicapping, it's really easy mechanics-wise to handicap two or three models. And then it feels like a very dissatisfying turn, but you're you're still able to do things um, depending on how well you maneuver and how well you you uh, work things out. Now, um, how uh, my guy, my my combat guy, I had those tracking beacons that I was shooting at the uh, alien alien creature. And I think that that was a super cool thing. I felt very accomplished once I got it. And I'm like, all right, we got this thing tied down. And, and I kept the mechanics going as it because the creature wouldn't know that he has a tracker on him. So uh, all of that to say, recommended. I look forward to, to bringing out the next video for you guys. And I'm going to cut out here. Uh, it's been a, a long night. So uh, like and subscribe. Comment down below what you guys think of the playthrough, what you guys think of the game. And I always try to hit those up and you guys have a good night and I will see you in the next one.